Hello, everyone. As a reminder, this is being recorded for distribution to the MOAS website and the East Kingdom YouTube page. Everyone who it will be appearing has consented to have their image used for SCA. Additionally, a reminder of the SCA harassment and bullying policy. The SCA prohibits harassment and bullying of all individuals and groups. Participants engaging in this behavior are subject to the appropriate sanctions. If you are subjected to harassment, bullying, or retaliation, or if you become aware of anyone being harassed or bullied, please contact a Seneschal, president of the SCA, or your kingdom's board ombudsman. Thank you so much, and I turn you over to your teacher. Okay, well, let's make sure I can still do this the way I set it up last night. Um, window. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Katja Gordon. Well, my name is, my technical name is Katrina Gordon, but almost everybody knows me as Katja. So, uh, I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. It should sh say menu planning with my name and some vegetables. Everybody nod if you can see it. Anybody not? Okay, we got nodding. Yay, nodding. Okay, um, to my knowledge, if you have questions, you should be able to chat, and I should be able to see them. Let me see. Ah, there's a chat window. Okay, so I have a chat window, so if you have questions, um, just type them in there, and I'm going to try to stop and ask about questions uh, at the end of every slide so that I don't forget what I said when you have questions at the end, because that can happen. Um, I have been cooking in the SCA for over 20 years. I've cooked everything from events that didn't have a kitchen at all, um, to basic events, to RPs and kingdom level events. I've been a Z head cook for Feast 15 times. And the two things I've always prided myself on for events is using all period recipes and that my that I never go over budget. So those are two big things for me. There's a couple other ones. And we'll talk about them as we go on. So I'm going to move to the next slide. And it's just our bullet points for what we're going to talk about during the class. If I can get this to work. Okay. So... The things I want to cover in the class are how period you want your menu to be, how period you want your does your budget allow you to be, where does your inspiration for a period menu come from, what sources will help you reach that level of periodness, and how can you be sure you can get all that you can from your budget while trying to feed all the people. Um, so. Those are our bullet points, and those are the points I want to make sure I cover over the class. If you feel like I missed something, or if you missed something, let me know. So, menu planning to me is a lot of fun. I like menu planning. There is never a point during menu planning where I go, oh, what was I thinking of? Why did I agree to do this? That does actually happen in kitchens occasionally. At least once. Uh, my running joke is, I quit the kitchen at least once every event that I cook, I never actually walk out, but normally at one point I will say, oh, what was I thinking? Humorously on the way into the apartment building after stepping outside around 6.30, I thought to myself, what was I thinking when I decided to teach a class? But like the kitchen, it'll be fine. Um, I find menu planning and cooking in SCA kitchens as a way to experiment. I get to learn new skills, I get to learn new food, uh, thanks to different feasts I've made, I've taught myself how to make pasta, cheese, sausage, and a few other things actually from scratch. When I plan a menu, I almost always have some sort of theme. The theme might be, I'm going to go to this country at this time period, and those are the recipes I'm going to look for. I've also done feasts based on actual historical events, such as um, the meeting at Calais, between Henry VIII and King Charles at the Field of the Cloth of Gold. Um, I also did the, the Kingdom Level 12th night I did, which really tickled me. I It was it was my honest dream menu. 
it was based on the 12 days of Christmas. Totally not period car carol, but I took nothing but period recipes to represent the gifts in the 12 days of Christmas, which was kind of fun. Inspiration for a menu can come anywhere, from anywhere. You can be inspired by, you're reading a book, and it says, Lady so-and-so married Lord so-and-so. And it tells you it was in France during the winter. Okay? They don't tell you anything about the menu. They don't tell you anything about what it was that they had to eat. And what, they didn't tell you anything about what they might have served. But you can look at the time period and you can say, well, in France, this cookbook or this manuscript was recording recipes at that time period. And it's in the winter time, so they would have had A, B, and C stocked up. And maybe they went hunting and they, they found a deer. So I know that I can make these recipes. And you can build menu from that. And that's the kind of thing that makes me stop and go, ooh, what can I do with that? Um, my suggestion is, especially if you're starting, pick some place that you're interested in. Pick some place you've eaten food from. Uh, I don't suggest anybody who's starting or even is maybe their second or third event in going, I'm going to go to Japan because I like sushi. Um, that might be more than you're ready to bite off. Uh, you might, A, documentation is harder to find. Food may not meet your budget requirements for your menu. So, if you're a newer cook, I would say start off with something you know. Or go someplace, like I said, go someplace you're interested in, but someplace it's not like going to the moon. I, I have a good friend who's on, the, who's on the call, or who's in the meeting, and she does a Mongolian persona, and she has been after me for years to do a Mongolian feast. I'm not ready for that. Um, for lots and lots of reasons. Most of them start with fermented horse milk. Um, so I'm not ready for that. I'm sticking with places I, I know and that I know I can get cookbooks for right now. Maybe at some point in the future I will actually make that, that piece for her. Okay. So anybody have any questions so far about where you might get inspiration from? No, we're good. Okay. We're going to move on. Maybe. Okay. So the worst question I ever got asked was from then Lady Allison Gray of Cranley. I had written up a menu, much like the ones I had written for the previous 10 years. I took recipes I knew from redactions and cookbook that I used with some frequency and went, hey, here's my menu. What do you think? My menu didn't have any rhyme or reason as far as time period time as far as time of the year it didn't take into consideration what i could get at that time of the year it's what i've been doing for the first 10 years of, of cooking the sca and there's nothing wrong with that but she said to me how period do you want your menu to be and i went um uh i i, I don't i don't know so she, oops, wrong screen. Okay, sorry. Um, so she taught me about looking at what time of year are you cooking in? What type of recipes would have used they used during that time of year? If you're cooking in the winter time, would you be using fresh strawberries? Probably not. In fact, I can guarantee not. Would you have had fresh lettuce? Maybe not. So what recipes are you going to find for a winter menu in your period cookbook that says, hey, this is what they would have cooked in winter. A lot of times, uh, if you're going to do a winter feast, if you look at Lent recipes, You'll find more that says, 
hey, this is the dead of winter, and this is what they were eating. Um, because it's what they had. I learned how to make plans to put things away if it was summer and I was doing a winter event. At the same time, I also learned about um, what would they have done midsummer? What would have been available? So I looked at a bunch of different things and I started learning about what foods were from some place for that specific place where I wanted to cook from. And that I found to be a big help. So I went, okay, and I got better. So then I come along and Mistress Juliana says to me, so did you look at the original recipe? And that had to do with a recipe from a book that I use a lot. It's called To the King's Taste. It's a book from the 1970s based on recipes from Form of Curry. And I had made I had made something and I submitted it for ANS and I went, I don't understand why this was wrong. And she says, Well, did you look at the period? Did you look at the original recipe? And I went, uh, no, no, I had it. So then she taught me about that. And I started going, Oh, okay. And that's a different level. So before I started looking at where food was coming from and what they would have had available in stores, I counted that as level one cook. When I started looking at where the stores were from, it was level two. When you start looking at, hey, this is the original recipe. Hi, this is my cat who's still in a cone. Um, when, this is blue. Hi, blue. Say hey, blue. Hi, hi. I don't know what you're doing. Okay, she's purring. Um, when I started looking at the, the original recipes and making my own redactions, that's kind of where you get into level three. So when you make your own redactions, it actually changes a lot. And that's our next slide. But there's, in my mind, there's two more levels for me to go to. The fourth one, sorry. Okay, you gotta have to go. You're cute, you're cuddly, you gotta, you gotta go. Sorry, guys. Um, the fourth one to me is when you start learning enough of the language where you can do translations of the original recipes. And she's back. Um, and the fifth level, which I don't know that I will ever get to, is if you start cooking period feasts out over open flames. I'm, I'm a weakling. I want my stoves. I want my ovens. I want to know that when I show up and I turn the fire on, the fire is going to be there. And it's going to be the temperature I said. That's, that's my preference. I don't know that I'll ever get to level five, but I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm hoping to get into level four at some point. Um, so we're going to talk about more of level three stuff. So, like I said, being a level three cook to me is when you start looking at the original recipe and you start doing your own redactions. You can use anything from the cookbook, but... Here's what you learn by looking at the original recipe. Their redactions might have been done based on what they thought the modern palette would like. So cookbook redactions are great, especially when you're starting. They give you an ingredient list. They give you how much of the ingredients you need. They give you clear instructions. And there really isn't a whole lot to overthink. Except for, hey, I decided to take this this recipe and make it for 100 people. Yay! Um, if you do your own redactions, you're looking at the original recipe and you're figuring out the instructions. You're figuring out how much you need. And you learn a better knowledge of the recipe. So you also end up learning more about where you're cooking from. Which, again, is, it all goes back to that inspiration of, well, I, I liked Italy, and I found this recipe online that was from this anonymous cook from the 1400s. And I went, ooh, I want to make that. But you can't just make that. You've got to make everything goes with it. And that 
because I looked at that original recipe and I built something around it, that was a lot of fun to me as opposed to, oh, here's a recipe somebody else figured out and I, I guess I'll make this and this and this. Um, I also feel like when you, when you follow the original recipe, you learn different things. You learn how to make different things. The downside original recipes are a lot like the recipes you get from your grandmother. Uh, and I'm going to bet most people in this room know those. Take a lump of sugar and or a lump of butter and some sugar and cream and then add appropriate amount of flour. Well, if you don't know what those amounts are, you're kind of guessing. And I know I've been there and had to redact a recipe from my grandmother going, uh, okay, I hope this is right. That's the other thing that's neat about doing your own redactions is if you don't come into cooking feasts or cooking for your family and you don't have a good understanding of how food works with each other. So I'm trying to think of a good example. Most people know if you're making meat, you put salt and pepper on it. Not everyone would think of making a stuffed pork chop and putting apples and cinnamon in the stuffing. Some people would be like, no, that's crazy. You can't do that. Why not? Yeah, I see you, Amelia. I see you. Um, but some people wouldn't think to make that step. When you look at the original recipes and you look at where the cook of that time took what they had available and put it through, you get to see how that food works together. And then you can get an understanding of, well, okay, they did this with this recipe. So when they give you these instructions for this other recipe, oh, okay, so that will work this way. So I find that part of doing your own redactions really interesting too. It helps you, it helps explain more about what the cook might have been thinking, what the cook might have had available. So, I, I have learned to love making my own redactions. It was not uh, an immediate love at first. Anybody have any questions? No. Okay. Okay, so there is a distinction I want to make because I keep talking about things being period and looking at the time period for the recipe and what foods would have been used. One of the things I want to make clear is a period menu is not the same thing as an arts and sciences food submission. And I had to learn this the hard way. Um, there are some distinct differences between an ANS cook or an ANS food oriented person and their motivations and in that context. I want to be, be clear about that because you can be both. I'm not saying that you can't. I'm saying the expectation is different. If you're trying to cook for people, you are less likely to take the time to research wheat, the wheat that would have been available then and with flour, because you're not likely to be able to afford in your budget to buy the closest period wheat to make all of the bread for the event or all of the pie crusts or all of the pasta. Your budget most likely is not going to allow for that. So the average period head cook is more interested in how do I make period food as close to possible as period within my budget and feed all the people? Because most feast cooks, their goal is to feed all the people. We want to make everybody fat, dumb, and happy and roll out of the feast hall going, oh, there's so much food. It was so good. That's my goal. If everybody leaves saying that or even something near that, I have done my job. Life is good. Um, the upside is when you start when you start playing with period recipes, you actually learn the starting place of most A and most arts and sciences food ideas and what their submissions would be like. 
Um, and knowing that actually can help you with getting your menu to be more period. So, um, the other thing I found the difference is, is most period cooks are looking for, oh, here's this neat recipe and it's different. And I think people will eat this. And most of the arts and sciences uh, people that I have talked to look at this neat recipe that's completely different and go, oh, this is neat. I wonder how close I can get it to period. And they want to go down all the ingredients. And they want to do, you know, well, where did the wheat come from? And where did the, this come from? And we might get there, but we're more interested in how do I make that within my budget? Um, the other thing I have found, excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. The other thing I have found is that a period cook looks at what will work for a modern palate. Um, and I can give you a really good example. To the King's Taste has a recipe that a lot of people are very familiar with in the SCA. We've eaten it. We've made it. Um, we can like it or we can hate it. Gourds and pottage. The original recipe calls for cube squash, chicken broth, onion, ground pork mixed with egg yolks, Saffron, salt, cinnamon, nutmeg, and ginger. Great. Uh, I see your face there, Amelia. You get that. that yeah. So when you make it by period, you don't squash. You don't squash the squash. You leave it in chunks. So what you have is chunks of squash in a spiced chicken broth with grumbled up pork. I don't like the way it looks. I don't really care for the way it tastes. You have to use special squash. I found out the hard way squash to peel during an event for a feast is hard. They don't peel easily. It takes a long time. It's also expensive. So on your average budget, you can't afford to make this period as period as possible. You can't afford to buy the, the appropriate squash to feed 100 people. And it's not appetizing. And personally, I think the, the original doesn't taste good. I don't care for the texture. I don't care for the taste. I don't think it blends well. So when I make it for an event, and when I make it at home, I use canned pumpkin. I went from, hey, here's really period recipe. I use everything exactly the same, except for I changed up and used canned pumpkin, which is really available and really cheap. And I can make that dish for 100 people for about $20. Completely different. It's still a period dish. It's still a period recipe. Everything's been used the same way. The only difference is that one that makes it cost effective and personally more palatable to the modern palate. If that wasn't redundant. Oh, I'm sorry. So, when I make that dish, I don't get a whole lot of leftovers. If I made it with it was cube squash, people will be looking at that going, mm, I don't know that I want to eat. Okay, I'll, I'll taste it. Completely different. And that's first time we use cube squash. Head cooks, we use canned pumpkin. Um... So, lost my I lost track of my my things. Hang on a second. Uh, okay, nope. So, again, that's not saying that A and S knowledge it can't be helpful. So, example, I made the Italian feast. I'm not sure who all here was for the Italian feast. I know Kim was there. So we did an Italian feast. We did the feast uh, based on a feast served on a feast day by Bartholomew Scappy because it was the same day as the event and we went down the menu. Now, the menu in his opera was not, hey, uh, your on a pasta menu is going to be, or your on a pasta course is going to be this. 
and your main course, your first main course is going to be this. No, nope, it just said, okay, you're going to have an octopasta course, you're going to have a kitchen course, you're going to have, no, I'm sorry, you're going to have a main course, a kitchen course, which is what they were calling their palate cleanser, and then a main course, and then a kitchen course, and then a sweet course. And I'm like, okay, that's a lot of food. And we made a lot of food um, because we based it off of that, which is very period. It's okay to take something that goes, oh, hey, here's a thing. We can do that. Um, but the other thing I did with it, which actually helped my menu, was I made my own cheese. I made all the pasta. I ground the spices because I could get the whole spices cheap. I got them bulk somewhere. I think at an Indian. Indian food restaurants are great for cheap spices. Um, or Indian shops, great for, for bulk spices, just as a uh, side note. Um, I did all of those things that were A and S related. So you can take a menu and you can take a dish and you can make it more period than just doing the redaction and doing everything by modern standards. Um, the thing I want to make note about this is when you're going through your menu and you're making your redactions, write things down. So the original recipe calls for uh, a chunk of butter and some sugar and a cup of flour. Well, at certain time periods, a cup of flour was only 12 ounces as opposed to I'm sorry, a pound of flour. A pound of flour is only 12 ounces compared to our 16. Okay, so did you measure it out at two cups using a cup for a pound? Did you weigh it? Did you figure out how much butter and how much sugar? Write it down. Write down anything you changed in the redaction. Write down, um, well, I can't get yellow, I can't get purple carrots cheap. So I'm going to use orange carrots, and this is the why. Write all of that down. And here's why I say this. If at any point you decide, I want to, I love this recipe. This recipe was fantastic, and everybody loved it, and I made it as close to period as I could for the event. Great. But you decide, hey, my local baron is having an ANS competition, and I want to wear that spiffy cloak. I think the cloak is awesome. I'm going to wear the spiffy cloak. And I actually have one. And I should have worn it today, and I apologize. I'll have to write to my baroness and go, oops, sorry. Um, and you go, I'm going to take this recipe, and I'm going to submit it. Fantastic. Because you wrote everything down while you were doing that, you're halfway there to your documentation. Because now you know, and you can remember what you did. I changed this because I couldn't afford that. I used this flour because flour was what was in my store, and... Um, I couldn't get the other flour, so I use this flour because I see that wheat went from here to here to here to here, and this wheat had 23 chromosomes, whereas the rest of them didn't. I actually had that research where I knew how many chromosomes were in the wheat. It's not pretty. Um, the other thing you can do with all of that information is you can make a booklet, and you can print it out, and you can share it with people at the event. Now, it's something I don't do, I, and it's something I should have done from the beginning, and I want to start rebuilding those recipes down and, and sharing them. And that's something else you can do is you can reshare, you can share them, and when you learn things about period food and you share them with your friends, you can inspire someone else to want to cook. And the one thing I, I kind of feel like we don't have enough of is cooks. Um, I know we say that probably about every part of the SCA that we don't have enough of X. But if you look at most events, you see the same names cooking over and over again. And it's one of the other reasons I want to teach this class and the class I'm teaching on the 20th is I'd love to inspire more cooks. It's it's not as scary as it might seem when you walk into the kitchen and the, the cooks got their heads their hair standing up on end and they're screaming at an inanimate object in there um so if you write all of this down you write down where you got your information from you can share it with people 
do that. More information is always more information, and we need more. Okay, any questions? Any thoughts? No, everybody's shaking their head. Okay, we're good. Um, okay, next. So, now we're going to talk budgets. I like budgets. I like to make budgets scream. Um, my, like I said, my second biggest rule is I don't go over budget. Strong tried to accuse me of going over budget one time, once, just once, and I didn't go over budget. I bought batteries for him. Those were his batteries. They were not on my budget. I didn't go over. And I will maintain that until I'm, I go away. So, one of the things I like to do is I like to make my budget say uncle, and I like to buy quality. I, you will never see me serve chicken thighs and legs. Unless the recipe specifically calls just for chicken thighs and legs. I don't do it. I want to serve chicken breast. I want to eat chicken breast. I think everybody else wants to eat chicken breast. That's what I'm going to buy. So I find ways. Stop laughing, Kate. I see you. Um, <laughs> um, I find ways to make my money stretch. Uh, one of the things I do when I build my menu, I build in season. If your recipes are calling for fresh strawberries and it's December, you're going to pay out, out a lot for fresh strawberries. And frozen strawberries don't work for most recipes. If they need to be pretty, don't use frozen strawberries. It doesn't work out well for anybody. Um, frozen peas, though, frozen peas are your friend. Um, you can get a pound of frozen peas for 99 cents in most grocery stores. You can get Three pound bag for like two forty nine, and for a hundred uh, for a hundred people, you only need like eight pounds of peas. Peas go a long way. Um, cooking season. If you're gonna do armored turnips, do them in the fall when turnips are are harvested, because they're cheap then. You try to do turnips in spring. People are going to be like, uh, turnips? No, it's it's April. I have no turnips. What you, what, turnips? No, no turnips. So you're going to pay more for them. Don't do that. Um, the next thing I do is I'm, I pick my battles when it comes to food. What can I make that saves me money? So one of the stories I tell is my first event cooking in Iron Bog. I'd already been cooking for probably eight years. And I was new to the area, and I didn't know anything. I didn't know where people were. I didn't know what stores they used. And Sterling takes me to the bakery that everybody uses, that everybody gets their bread from. And the first, pro and, and we called, and we ordered the bread ahead. And they said, we can pick it up between 3 and 5. I said, okay. We showed up at 4.30, and the lady was mad at me. Because in her mind, we were late, because it was 4.30. So they had put all our bread back. And I'm like, um, uh, oh, okay. And then we got the loaves they were going to give us. The loaves were this big by this big. So, like a flattened out football. And they were $1.50 a loaf. And I needed like 25 loaves. And I watched a big chunk of what, to me, looking at my budget, was a big chunk of my money going away for bread. I'm like, I can make bread. Bread's cheap. Bread's easy. So I tried to make my own bread. Because... It's cheap for a feast, for just a plain feast. If I have yeast in the house, it costs me maybe five dollars to make bread and a little time. That's worth it to me. I would much rather spend an afternoon baking bread because bread smells wonderful and serve that at my feast than spend twenty five to thirty dollars on bread. I want to feed people food. I don't want to give them bread. Um I do the same thing with chicken stock. You can buy eh, so so chicken stock at Restaurant Depot. You can buy eh, so so chicken stock at your grocery store. But you're going to pay for it. I can buy a family value thing of chicken at Wegmans for $12. And my little herbs and spices, I'm going to wrap up in my cheesecloth. And I can boil a thing of chicken that then I'll turn into chicken salad or anything else that's for us here at home. And I can make two to four gallons of chicken stock for like $15 as opposed to 20 or $30 for 
depending on how much you need, buying from the store. Um, there's things I don't skimp on. I make time. I, if I'm going to make my bread, I'm not making pie crust. I like pie crust, but pie crust is fussy. If you're making pie crust in July, prepare to be cranky because it's going to be cranky and it's going to take forever and it's going to make you nuts and it's time consuming. And I can buy the frozen unroll and use or I can buy frozen already in a tin and it's worth the cost. Less aggravation, worth the cost. I also do not make almond milk. I know lots of people who make their own almond milk. Okay, first off, almonds are expensive. They've gotten worse since everybody is drinking almond milk now. Ooh, almond milk, almond milk. So almonds are now more expensive because they're using so many of them to make almond milk. Hey, I can get a half gallon of almond milk, but it's not sweetened for $1.99. I can't pay $1.99 for the amount of almonds that I need to make that much almond milk. Plus, then I've got all these almonds around. Okay. Well, once I make a baklava or something else full of almonds, I've got a bunch of almonds to just throw out. And who wants to do that? So I don't make almond milk anymore. But I do make things to make up for it. Um, if I know that I'm doing a winter event and I want preserves, I will go out, I will pick the fruit, I'll make my own preserves. I'll pick all my own vegetables. I have a dear friend, uh, Lady Celine, who makes sauerkraut, and she does it in almost a period way. And she made sauerkraut for me the year we did a German feast. My God. Um, we did a German feast. She made sauerkraut for me. And it was fantastic. Um, and if you're doing something, you're like, well, I don't have the space. I live in a one-bedroom apartment. We don't have space. But I have friends that have houses. I have closets. And they don't mind putting preserves away for me to hold on to. Um, when I made... But 50 pounds of flour into bread uh, last fall, I filled up our uh, one of our Baroness's deep freeze with nothing but bread. And she went, eh, I wasn't using it. I'm like, okay. So find ways that you're willing to do that will save you money. If you can make bread and you don't like to make bread, make the bread. It's cheaper. And it tastes better. And before the pandemic, people were like, oh, you made bread. Bread is awesome. Now everybody's making bread. I'm not impressed with it anymore. People were like, oh, it's bread. No, oh, great, bread. Maybe that'll maybe that'll wear off after a while. Um, the next thing I do for, for, for budget control, and this is the big one. In my mind, this is the big one, portioning. So my Laurel told me a story about a coronation feast she cooked years and years and years ago. And to this day, my stomach hurts. They served everyone. Every single person got a full Cornish hen. Everyone got like six, pounds, six ounces of cooked roast beef and roast pork loin. And multiple side dishes and bread and sweet dishes. It was like a four-hour feast. And... Every human being got pounds of food. Okay, so the difference definitely between now and then is people are more health conscious. People are not eating as much. People are watching what they eat. And that even includes when they go to events. I have a, I have a friend who's doing keto, and when she comes to events, she's like, okay, I can eat meat and vegetables. What do you got for me? I'm like, uh, I got you covered. Okay. Um, I refuse to send people home with a Ziploc bags full of food. They paid for one meal. They might take a couple slices of beef home with them. Maybe. They might not. I, I've done events where somebody came in going, give me more beef, and there was little, literally a sliver. After the, after the serving staff and the kitchen staff got to eat, there was a sliver of beef, and that was it. And they're like, aw. I portion the heck out of my events. So the way I do it personally is two-thirds portions worth of the popular things. Starches are your big ones. So like your rice dishes, your noodle dishes, um, certain sweet dishes. People are like, mm. 
um, a half portion of anything less popular. Most vegetable dishes. Salad. I keep watching cooks bring out the biggest bowls possible of salad. You know where that salad ends up? At Baroness Creature's house feeding her chickens. Because nobody eats that much salad. We like salad. Salad's great. But we know there's better food coming. I'm not going to fill up on salad. Come on now. There's meat. There's bread. It'll be awesome. Um, Speaking of bread, I don't give them much, very much bread. I remember the days when a table of eight got two round loaves of bread. And everybody's just like, oh, I've been fighting all day. Bread. Rah, 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 rah. And then the food comes out. And everybody's like, oh, peek, 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 peek. No. No, 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 no. I will make long loaves. I cut them in half lengthwise. And then I slice them. And there's two slices, technically one, for each person at the table. And you know what? It's really rare that anybody comes to me and says, I need more bread. It happens occasionally. We have some breadaholics. I'll admit it. But for the most part, they then eat the food. And the food gets fed to people. And it's wonderful. And they're happy. And I'm happy. Um, for meats, if I'm cooking for 100 people, so for me, 100 people is 80 people in seats. Roughly 20 people for my staff. I feed my staff. I feed my kitchen staff. If you're a dedicated server and you are in the kitchen, you have not, okay, I'm going to serve, and then I'm going to sit my butt down and eat. No, no. Then you, have, then you have paid for a seat. If your butt is in the seat, you're paying for feast. But if you're in my kitchen and you're not doing that, you're getting fed. So I normally keep like 20 portions out for feeding my staff. And... For example, at River War, Sterling runs around like a madman and never sits down to eat. So when he comes in, I'm like, here, have food. Because we want our staff not to die from, you know, hunger. Bad. So if I'm doing an 80-person feast, I'm cooking for 100. For that amount of people, I buy 31 to 33 pounds of chicken. And I buy 36 to 40 pounds of beef or pork if I'm roasting it. Of course, I'm making chicken soup unless I'm buying less chicken. I don't need 33 pounds of chicken. Um, I no longer make Cornish hens. I have bad stories about Cornish hens. They're just never happening again. If you decide that you want to make Cornish hens, more power to you. Um, I say half a Cornish hen per person. They need 50. Um, let's see. So, any questions on budgeting or portioning? Any questions? No questions. Okay. No questions is good. Um, pricing. So, when I started in the SCA, a basic feast normally went for about $8 a head. Basic feast being two meats, some starches, some bread, um, really basic recipes. $8 a head. Right now, you can't do that. Um, I know all of you have probably been in the grocery store and beef prices are horrendous. Um, or at least to me, they're horrendous because I really shouldn't be paying almost $20 for six pounds of hamburger. It bothers me. But okay, pandemic. We'll work with it. Um, if you have a small f event, you know that you're only going to be feeding like 50 people. Do $8 a head. You're going to have some leeway. It's fine. Because you're not doing anything spectacular. Um, and I wouldn't. For a really small event, I, I don't pull out all the stops because the equivalent of a really small event and not taking anything away from that, but for the most part, the equivalent of the small event is dinner at a keep. Okay, everybody who lives here is coming for dinner. Yep. They're going to get some meat, and they're going to get some starches, and they're going to get some vegetables, and they're going to get some bread. And that's an $8 feast. So then the next one I normally go up to is $10. And most of my feasts are $10. They'll involve something. They'll involve something special. They'll involve um, maybe a fancier dish where it's not just roast meat. Um, and there's definitely a sweet. There's definitely a sweet dish. Um, eight at ten dollars a head. Excuse <coughs> me. For an eighty-person feast, you have eight hundred dollars. I don't cook at eight hundred dollars. 
I could go between seven hundred, between six fifty and seven hundred, and here's why. If I'm playing a feast, and it's in the winter, and I'm starting in April, I'm planning to, to budget out at six fifty to seven hundred because I don't know what's happening to the butter prices between now and then. I don't know what happens. I'm not don't know what's going to happen to the dairy prices, whether it be milk or almond milk or cheese or what's going to happen to meat prices. I've even seen eggs go crazy. So I don't plan to cook. I don't plan my budget all the way to $800. Here's the other problem. If you plan your budget to all the way to $800 and you go out and you spend every cent of that $800, you have now just ruined your whole portioning thing because now you have too much food. You're buying in bulk. You're going, if you're going to Restaurant Depot or you're going to uh, BJ's or Sam's Club, you're buying in bulk. You're getting that meat two to three dollars less a pound than if you were buying in the grocery store. So if you spend every cent of that eight hundred dollars, you've got too much food. You're gonna be sending home people with food. Um but it allows a cushion. So the other cool thing about having the cushion is for example, my baroness, my current baroness, loves lamb. Loves lamb. And Starling says if you make lamb, you have to talk to the lammies. Here are the lammies. We're going to put rosemary on you. Put the oven. He talks to the lamb whenever he helps in the kitchen. It's really weird. Um, but he's cute and I like him, so it works. Um, she loves lamb. Well, lamb's not cheap. But if I have a cushion, I can buy lamb. And I can make my baroness super happy. It's a good thing. Um, that $8 a head, you don't have a cushion. You're not buying lamb. If I do a super fancy feast, such as the Italian feast with way too much food, or the 12th night um, kingdom level event, I do $12. $12 is the most I've ever charged for a menu. And $12 recipe, if you have a $12 feast, you need to pull out the stops. You need to make it wow. And it's normally an RP because you want to impress an RP. You want to impress the royals. You want to impress the people who are traveling with the royals. Again, it goes back to periodness. If you were in period and the king comes rolling up with his entourage, hey, guys, I'm here to visit. You're going to feed me. You're like, oh, wow, what's in the stores? What can we pull out and feed the king? And what can we do to make it fancy? Those are the kind of feasts that will get noted in, historic, in history books. Um, and that's what you want to do because the king is there. And it's not because you're like, ooh, look at the me king. No, he's the king. He's supposed to get special. How that works. Um, again, part of being period. Okay, so one thing I didn't talk about today so far, and I want to cover a little bit is, oh, I didn't ask. Did anybody have any more questions? I'm sorry. I should have asked. Um, no? Okay, we're still good. Okay, so... I want to just touch on this because we're we're supposed to be here for an hour. I'm going to run a little late. That's okay. Um, day boards. Day boards are a completely different animal from from feasts. Um, and most of you have done a day board, but I the, the people I can see pictures of right now have done day boards because they've done day boards with me. Except for I know Emma Cat's probably done a bunch of day boards too, knowing her. Um, day boards are a different animal. Day boards are this cool mixture of hey here's all this stuff you can cut up ahead of time and then here's this cook stuff you're going to do and i personally feel that day boards should also follow sort of a theme if you are the day board cook or you're working with the day board if you're excuse me if you're the day board cook and the feast cook or if you're the day board cook and you're working with a feast cook you can follow the same theme if i went to germany for the feast i will probably go to germany for the day board just to keep it all in the family, plus I don't have to try to research two different books. Because I don't need that kind of headache, neither does anybody else. If you are the day board cook and you're just doing day board, first off, oh, thank you, we love you. Um, because I've done both in a day, it's exhausting. Um, if you are the day board cook and you're not the feast cook and you want to do something different, go for it. You don't have to do the same thing, same theme as the, the feast cook. It's cool. Do your thing. Um, but you're going to do some, probably some cooked food. So you might do a, uh, you might do a, a rice dish. You might do a, um, 
roasted meat if you can get it cheap. You might do quiches. I like quiches. Quiches, quiches are a beautiful thing because you can make a whole bunch of quiches for cheap. Um, you might make beef, meatballs because, again, you can make a whole bunch of meatballs for cheap. Um, the problem with day boards, and interestingly, I've learned from different places I've traveled, there aren't a whole lot of kingdoms that do day boards anymore. Um, I've been to at least three kingdoms that don't do day board. They're like, oh, nope, bring your lunch. You want to eat? Bring your lunch. Or, hey, we're going to have this food over here, but it's like a box lunch. You have to pay for it. Um, I've become a huge fan of pre-regging day board. A lot of people complain about it. We don't charge you extra for the day board. It's part of the, the feast, the, the event fee. But we want to know you're coming so that we can plan for you. I have planned day boards for 400 people and had 200 people show up. They did not eat 400 people's worth of food. I've planned for 350 to 400 people, and we got 767 people, a number that will live in infamy for me. We did not have enough food, um, and there's nothing worse than that in my mind. Oh, my God, I'm out of food. What do I do? Um, Mr. Juliana has wait. Mr. Juliana has ways to work around that. That day, it wouldn't have worked for me because I was just too freaked out. Um. But my quick calculation for day boards is if you don't do the pre-reg for a day board, figure 50 people over the break-even. Example, River War is 50 people camping, 250 people to break uh, for the day trip to break even. I figure for day board anywhere, if they're not pre-regging, anywhere from 350 to 400 is who I'm looking for. And again, we're back to portioning. Uh, you're not making full servings of everything. The average budget for a day board is $1.50 to $2 a head. Use all the money. In feast cooking, I will tell you, don't use all the money. But for day board, use all the money. All of it. Every cent. If you have two pennies to rub together when you're done buying day board, you've done perfect. Um, especially if it's not a pre-reg. Because you'll probably need all the food. And if you don't need all the food... Uh, see what the head cook can work into the feast if you're not the head cook. Um, or make people take stuff home. So, again, portion control. So I apply psychology to cooking. Uh, like I said about the, the bread at uh, feast where you cut it lengthwise and then you slice it so people aren't getting, like, slabs of bread. I do the same thing for day boards. I refuse to cube meats and cheeses. And I've had people fight me in my kitchens. What do you mean we're not cubing? You're cubing. We're not cubing. We're slicing. No, we always cube. Well, I'm telling you we're not. We're slicing. But no, no, we always cube. So here's the psychology. If you walk through a dayboard line, and that's all of us, I that counts me too. You walk through a dayboard line, and there's three different meats, and you like them all. And there's three different cheeses, and you like them all. You take a spoonful of each of them. So now you've got... Five or six cubes of each one of those things. You're not going to eat five or six cubes of all of those things. But your brain says, oh, they're cubes. I'll eat them quick. It'll be wonderful. And then you don't. And then you waste them. Because you thought that you would eat them all. But then you got down the line and you saw this really awesome rice dish. So you took some of that. And then you saw this, oh, there was just this quiche. And it was so pretty. And it had cheese. And it had mushrooms. And it had eggs. That was, oh, I had to have some of that. And then there was this other thing. And then all of those cubes, they're the last thing you eat. And then most of the, the most of them don't get eaten. And they get thrown out, which makes me sad and cranky. So I don't cube. I refuse to cube. If you slice, and by slice I mean you get the block of the thing, you cut it in half lengthwise, and then you slice as thin as possible. I've been known to show up with my sister's uh meat slicer I'm not gonna lie um if you slice and you arrange them pretty people will be like oh there's two slices of bread because you take two slices of bread even though it's only really a half a slice and you take a couple slices of meat because you're making a sandwich in your mind and you take a couple slices of cheese and you know what they'll eat that 
and they won't throw that out. They might throw away maybe one of your slices of bread. Ooh, half a slice of bread got thrown out. I'm heartbroken. Not really. Because they didn't throw out five ounces of meat and cheese. They ate those two slices. They ate their two slices of cheese. I didn't have to spend $200 on blocks of meat and cheese. And everybody was still full and happy and hungry. And not hungry. Um, I... Like again, I said, with uh, day boards, I use the same thing I do for menus. Take all vegetables. Um, buy fresh, it's in season. Don't try to do weird things in the wrong season because it doesn't help you. Um, it just ups your prices. And for day boards, the more expensive an item is, the less of it you can have. Because a dollar fifty to two dollars a head, where everybody's like, "Oh my God, that that's barely any food." Oh no, you're buying in bulk. It's fine. Um, but there's ways again to make it stretch. Use the quiches, buy the pie crust, make meatballs, um, pickle your own vegetables. If you're laying out pickles and vegetables, lay them out on a platter, stretch them out. There's no way to see the last of anything. So instead of them taking, ooh, I'm going to take this big ham, this big thing of pickled vegetables. It'll be wonderful. And then they don't eat them. But if it's spread out, oh, well, they're almost out of it. So maybe I should just take one spoonful. Psychology works with, with cooking. It's hilarious. Okay. Any questions about day boards? Okay. Uh, let's see. We are to the end of the class. Um, I know rattled on for an hour and nobody asked any questions. I'm hoping that's a good thing. But if you think of questions, I'm here. Um, I am always interested in helping. If you have questions, if you think of something, my contact information is here. You can find me on Facebook as Katja Gordon. Um, ask me questions. If you decide to run a kitchen and you're someplace I can get to and you need a grunt and I can get to your event, reach out. I'll come and watch this just for you. If you decide you're going to build a menu because you want to do an event before you show it to anybody else, you want somebody else to look at it and go, hey, I have this idea for an event uh, menu and I have this book and and or I found this this great stuff online and and. Um, can you look at it? I would gladly do, for, do that for you. I am not the all end all. This is all of this is from my perspective. All of this is my opinion. Um, it's all based on my experience of, like I said, a little over 20 years cooking in the SCA and watching how people eat and what they eat and what they're willing to try. Um, on the 20th, I'm going to do a class about the actual running of the kitchen. The, okay, you've got your menu, and now you got to make it for 100 people. Crap, how do I do the math? Um, how do I do the shopping? And will all of that fit in my car? Um, things to do the day of to help you keep your sanity, and how to handle the aftermath. Um, that's on the 20th. It's, again, at 7 o'clock. I hope that if you enjoyed this class, um, please let me know. Or please, you know, show back up. It should be fun. I have fun stories, uh, I hope. Um, the next two slides are places that I go back to over and over again. Um, I like, as I mentioned, To the King's Taste. And I like Fabulous Feasts. My Italian go-tos are the Neapolitan... Yes, Neapolitan. I always confuse it with the ice cream. And, then it gets, and, and there's that little short you know, guy from France. Um, yes, Neapolitan ice cream was Neapolitan ice cream when I was a kid. Don't laugh. Uh, the opera of Bartholomew Scappi, I love. Um, Rumbolt. Rumbolt is Tiger Cat, as she's on here. Uh, MCAT uh, Grassy did the translation for that. She's amazing. If you have questions about it, we find it online. She is willing to hear you go, hey, so I found your translation, and oh, um, oh, oh, okay, what do I do with this? 
Um, I have never met her in person. I've only ever talked to her online, and she's awesome and very fun and very knowledgeable. Ooh. Oh, cool. There's more translated now. Yay! Um, Mr. Juliana has a copy of that translation of Rumpel that MCAT did. Uh, so if you decide you want to do something German, uh, let me know, and I can work on getting you a copy, or you can talk to herself, uh, MCAT over here, and she can probably help you out with that. Um, let's see, and there's more. There's more. Uh, Cryodox Miscellanea. I have a copy of these, and I did not realize, either I have another book that I didn't see last night when I was making sure that I had the thing spelled right. I did not have Cryodox name spelled right. He's, he's, uh, apparently he was greedy and wanted an A and an I. I only had an A. Um, I did not realize there's more in that book than I thought that I will have to now explore. And now I'm excited. Oh, ooh, what else is in here? Um, but there's a whole bunch of things, uh, from Cryodoc and Elizabeth at this website. And if you search by Google and you just look, look for Cryodoc, I want to go back to it. I didn't include it in here because it's not just the food. But they, he has a whole bunch of articles about being a persona and um, the C in SCA and interesting outlooks from probably 30 years ago. But I'm interested now in reading the articles because it's always interesting to see where we came from and where we are now. Um, I like foodtimeline.org. Um, it saved my life one day when I couldn't remember where watermelon was from. How long ago has it been watermelon? How old is watermelon? Because somebody told me, well, watermelon is not period. I'm like, no, watermelon is period. Watermelon's Egyptian. So if anybody tells you you can't serve watermelon at an event, tell them they're wrong. Um, so I like this. So when I can't remember what an ingredient uh, is in the timeline, you can look it up there. It's helpful. Also, uh, Good Cookery is great. It's a lot of redactions by SCA cooks. Most of them don't include the original recipe. So it's their redactions. If you use the redactions and you're doing a booklet, give that cook credit. Um, same thing with anything else. If you're using somebody's translation, give them credit for the translation in your booklet. Um, it's the nice thing to do. And then nobody yells at you later going, you used my translation, and you didn't even say hi. That was nice. Um, same thing with here. Um, and don't let anybody grumble at you if you use, um, if you use something from a website. I had this happen to me. If you use something from a website, and the website lists the person as lady so-and-so at that time, and you give them credit at that as that. They were lady so-and-so from the website when you did it. If you post it someplace and somebody comes back and grumbles at you that they are now mistress blah, 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 you have no way of knowing that. Do not feel bad. You took the information from the website. You took what was available. That person probably knows a person. They're standing up for them, and they're allowed. Don't feel bad. Use the information on the source that you got it from. Um, if you find, ooh, I don't know what I just did. Um, if you find, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this now. Um, if you find a source that you love, if you find a period cookbook you love, a manuscript you love, share it with me. I just started playing with Span Spain. I was going to do Spanish for River War. I found one book. I'm kind of okay with the recipes. I would have made it work for River War. But now I have a whole year to play with it. So, um... If you find sources, share. Um, share with your fellow cooks. Uh, SCA Cooks is on Facebook. Um, if you have something you love, check. You know, share it there. Um, share it with your local groups. Encourage people to cook. And that's my class. That's what I got. So I hope everybody had a great time. I'm not really sure how to bow out of this. Um, Thank you, MCAT, for coming. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I really do appreciate it. I'm, I'm super glad that people came out for the class because I'm not going to lie. I was a little worried there that nobody would show. Um, 
and I think I'm. I think that's it. I think I'm gonna say good night. Wonderful. Thank you so much for teaching. I will stop the recording now. Thank you.